Hi, I'm Ashley with Campbell. Thanks for investing your time to help your community be a great place to live. Before you watch the video, make sure to click the subscribe button so that we can help you make educated decisions as a board member. Hello, everybody. Uh, name is Rudy Forehand with Benjamin Moore Paints. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm bringing up my presentation as we speak. Um, I am with uh, Benjamin Moore Paints. Uh, I've been with Benjamin Moore Paints for uh, 30 years, 33 years now. And Ashley, do you see my presentation? I do. I see the whole thing. Perfect. perfect. Now okay. I see it perfect. Terrific. Terrific. Thank you. So I've been with Benjamin Moore for 33 years working here in the, Benjamin, in, uh, in the South Florida market from Miami uh, now to the Palm Beach and Treasure Coast market. So um, I been around paint for a little bit of time and uh, so I understand products a little bit and the reason that we uh, I like to put on this class is as you're choosing paint and painting when you paint your community or paint your uh, even for maintenance uh, it, the knowledge of knowing what you're using is always going to give you a little bit better idea to use your money wisely and so this is a real important part for me so um, we'll go through and kind of teach a little bit about what we're going to be doing here this is the um, just the technology, the, the uh, technology class and the provider information and the license number and so forth. Um, again, what we're trying to do is just give you an idea of what the, the ingredients that go into a can of paint so you can better understand when you're trying to choose between one and the other and to get a better understanding of the variety of coatings they are. Uh, I wish that was able to make one, one can of paint for all surfaces. However, there are different ingredients and different things that allow products to work a little bit better and to be able to give it at a price point that's going to be uh, that's going to be reasonable for you for you and your community to use as you go forward. So these are the different learning objectives we're going to be having um, and uh, of what we're trying to do and it, these will make a little bit more sense as you try as we go through the class and you'll get a better understanding of it um, and we'll move forward. So the um, the purpose the, the purpose of using paint um, Obviously, it's oops, sorry about that. Um, is for generally when you use paint, most people think that using paint is going to be for aesthetics. Oh, I want to make a, a building pretty. We've got color cards in my background, so you can see everything's about making it look look good and increasing the value of your property, which is a very important part of painting. However, the part that I get involved with and over the years have been is the what the protection that coatings and paint brings to you and your surfaces that you're painted. And this is really primarily, this is very, very important because most of the substrates that we're painting, when they're built, they're, they're designed to receive coatings for protection. Your buildings are, and generally the, the, the paint coatings is going to be the time when you want to be able to look at your property if you're painting outside or even inside and get a coating that's going to give you the type of protection that you need. And it's really important to be able to understand this as you move forward when choosing coatings is Think of coatings for protection, not so much what they look like, because all paintings will pretty much look the same uh, afterwards. The better quality coatings will last better, but the protection is really what you really need to consider when you're choosing coatings itself. So let's get into a little bit more of the, start explaining the different types of coatings on there so you could have a better understanding of, of, of what you're looking for. So when you meet with people, you could uh, uh, understand the, the, the coatings that they're talking about. Uh, in general, there are three basic type of coatings that we deal with in our industry. Uh, there's architectural coatings, and this is going to be primarily where uh, we we live. Uh, it's going to be regards to painting inside, outside of buildings and facilities and so forth. Um, there's industrial coatings. You might touch a little bit on this uh, for specific needs, but these are generally used for chemical and for metal surfaces where they're going to get chemicals uh, being used on the coatings itself and then special purpose coatings. So these are the general types of coatings. Again, architectural coatings is a quick review. Um, essentially, it's for residential, public buildings, retail hospitality. Again, a lot of the different things that we run into and that we live, that we are uh, managing and that we're running into all the time. Industrial coatings, again, they, they're made more to, for metal surfaces or where we need uh, protection of the surfaces, more primarily for protection than aesthetics. Um, for all these kind of conditions we have on here, for instance, extreme conditions, corrosion especially is, is an important part when you're using industrial coatings. And there's a whole world of understanding to be able to use that there. 
and then the special special purpose coatings. And this is where generally we lump everything else in, in regards to um, anything that has, even the inside of cans has a, a coating. Uh, that protects the metal and protects the food from being contaminated by the metal. So it's pretty amazing the 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 breadth that coatings are used in in, in everyday need, and you run into that uh, all the time and all around you. So, but as we move forward, let's talk about and the one thing that you're going to look at in all coatings is that the component of coatings are generally the same, regardless of what industry you're in. You're in. Um, there's not a whole lot of secrets being made in paint. Paint has been around uh, since the cavemen were been drawing the, uh, the pictures on caves. And, and that is in itself kind of a form of coding itself. So uh, it's important for us to understand these, com these components and what, the, what they mean to the, the protection and the durability of the coding. And so you can get a better understanding when you see a can of paint that costs $20 a can, and you've got a gallon of paint, the same size you have on there, or you have one that costs $70 a can of paint. And nowadays, unfortunately, that's a, with, with what we've gone through, uh, that's not an unusual circumstance. We wanted you, uh, what I would like to just to emphasize that you're, what you're getting is just the better quality, the better quality of the components that we're, that we're going to be reviewing here in a little bit. And it gives you better protection, better durability. Uh, and more, most coatings are made specifically for certain surfaces. Um, and uh, there would be a great idea to have one for everything, but uh, the components just don't work that way. So this gives you a better, this will give you a better understanding. Well, let me go back. So the basic components you're gonna find in any can of paint are gonna be uh, the three, the four, salt, the four components that you see here, uh, pigments, resins, additives, and solvents. We're gonna go over that in a little, in, in detail on each piece here. Uh, pigments, for the most part, will give you hide. They're going to give you color. They're going to give you protection as well. And so when you see a, a coat of paint, this is what you're, what you're seeing. The rest of the components are there, but we'll, I wanna, we'll dive a little bit into what each of these components look like and what they kind of overview kind of do for you. So there's generally five types of pigments used in coatings itself. Um, we're going to go over each one in a little bit, but they give the can of paint for uh, the unique per, uh, performance characteristics. And then there's always a balance. Paint, there's no secret in making paint. Uh, it's very easy, but manufacturers use different balances of these chemicals and different balances of each of the quality of these chemicals to be able to get a product that's going to, uh, at the price point, that's going to do the work that you need the application ease that you need to have this applied with uh, and the, the durability at the same time. So it's a kind of a balance. So uh, you're, you're, you're gonna be looking at one price to the other. Um, the, the one thing before I go dive in any further, when you're looking at coatings, there's no, like I said, there's no secrets. Most manufacturers, most national manufacturers buy from the same, um, from the same places to uh, the raw materials. So there's no secrets to it. So the best way to be able to look at price, to look at the differences between quality of coatings between one manufacturer and the other, is look at the price point. Some if they're within five to ten percent of each other, uh, then you're looking at similar quality coatings. Don't let yourself be fooled that a coating that costs twenty five dollars a gallon is equal to the quality of a coating, especially in working in commercial and in, in a commercial situation, is equal to a quality of coating that's fifty. There's it's impossible to do too competitive a market for that to happen. So keep that in mind. So these are the, the different type of pigments, uh, prime white, color, inert, metallic, and specialty. And we're gonna take a little bit of time to go through each one of them. So you get a better understanding uh, of, where, of where these, what these pigments do for the coating itself. Prime white uh, is essentially the whiteness that you see in, in, in a can of paint. It's primarily made out of titanium dioxide, TiO2. Uh, titanium is a very popular uh, ingredient to use in paint itself. Um, it, it's used in, a, in just about any type of system, situation where you see a white coating. It's a mineral that it, that, that is mined, uh, and it's very prevalent in all kinds of in, in all kinds of uh, materials that you use itself. Um, in the pig and this prime white, we also get color, and this is where when you start getting different shades of color, that's where uh, this kind of hides. And then this is primarily where you're going to get 
uh, the hide and opacity um, uh, that you're going to see on the coating itself. So, and we're going to dive a little bit into it, but uh, again, we could talk about paint all day long. Is that detailed? But how how are co a coating hides and uh, and gives you the opacity that you're looking for is pretty unique and is based on on our functions as as individual human beings. Um, titanium dioxide gives it a whiteness. It gives you opacity um, and it gives you the resistance to chemicals and most importantly to code to ultraviolet light or down in South Florida we get a, quite a bit of it thankfully. Um, however, titanium dioxide is also one of the most expensive ingredients used uh, components used in can of paint. So uh, it, again, the higher amount of titanium that you could use, the better it's going to be for you. But again, it, paint is always a balance to achieve what you need to achieve, what, you, what you, price point that you're trying to get at and what you want that coating to do for you. Color, and again, essentially, there's two basic sources of color. There's synthetic sources, we call that organic, uh, and then natural, which, sounds, which is uh, in, uh, inorganic. It should be kind of opposite, but this is the way the industry uh, uses this. Uh, but you'll understand why the definition is the organic or synthetic tints uh, come from plants and animals and, and, and synthetic resources. And these are the areas, these are the things, the colors that you see that are real bright, that are, that are real colorful, like a bright red or a bright yellow and so forth. And these kind of colorants, uh, these kind of colorants, to, you know, give you a lot of nice, pretty color, but they tend not to be as durable, especially to ultraviolet rays as, as others. And then the inorganic, they come from natural resources, for instance, you know, from minerals and clays. And there's reds in organic tints and reds in inorganic tints. And the, uh, the differences, you'll see that the general difference between one and the other is that the inorganic or the natural resources, the color tends to, and we call it in the industry, be a little bit, look a little bit more dirty uh, than the, uh, the than the real clean colors, but the durability, especially in exterior surfaces, uh, uh, is quite a bit of difference between one and the other. Again, um, a, the other things you have to keep into into mind: certain the color pigments will give you the the, the strength of the coating. It helps to the strength of the coating, the opacity and transparency vary. Um, for instance. The, those re clean reds and clean yellows we were just speaking about, they tend to be not as opaque uh, as its counterpart in uh, the inorganic sources where they, they do tend to absorb light a little bit more. And of course, the, the colors are a little bit more reactive to, uh, to heat and to chemicals. And for instance, if you paint a inorga uh, an, an organic color outside, uh, it might be more susceptible to when you bleach wash a house. For instance, if you're using a, a red and a yellow or a peach color and you, you want to use bleach to clean mildew off, uh, you might have the color affected by that. So these are certain, these are considerations you have to take when choosing colors and choosing coatings as well. It's quite a bit of it to be, to be useful. So now when you uh, break down into the colorants itself, all paints right now are manufactured in bases. So in other words, Everything that is every pretty much every color that you choose are custom mixed colors. Um, this is a, allows the stores to, to carry fewer SKUs uh, at the same time to give you the widest variety and widest capability of colors itself. When you break down the colorants themselves, there's a universal colorant. Uh, and again, these are colorants that are uh, made that are used in pretty much any kind of paint from waterborne or latex paints. To, uh, to oil-based paints. Then there's waterborne colorants that are a little bit more environmentally friendly. We're gonna talk a little bit more about each one. And industrial colorants that are used for those industrial coatings. Um, and, they, and again, a lot of this is determined, we'll get into it a little bit by uh, which colorant you use by the resin that you're using. And we're gonna to touch base on that a little bit. But again, universal colorants are used in uh, water-based paints, alkyds, synthetic enamels, they can contain a lot of glycols, and uh, glycols are just a chemical that's used in paint to allow products to mix together. They're generally very high in VOCs or volatile organic compounds, and these are the uh, the compounds that are released into the atmosphere when the coating uh, evaporates, and which causes a lot of um, uh, you know causes some of the issues to the to the ozone layer. Uh, one of the many things, and you'll find that. The VOCs is a real important part of 
why coatings have changed so much over the last 20 years. It's been a pretty uh, significant change in, in, in the coatings itself. And the darker colors you have when you're using your universal colorants, the higher the VOC level uh, is, is. So you have to keep that in consideration, especially when you're using an interior, in, in interior environments. Waterborne colorants, this is kind of the, the, new, the new age of uh, paint. And in other words, these are uh, colorants that are made actually with a little bit of binder or a little bit of resin, but they uh, are, again are made to, uh, they have a lower VOC. They're generally used only in water-based coatings itself. And uh, again, a lot of manufacturers manufacture their, their, their uh, buy these coatings, these colorants from, uh, from outside sources. Uh, we don't, but we manufacture our own, but uh, they, they do not, these coatings generally do not add uh, VOCs to a, a paint surface. So for interior surfaces, especially, um, they tend to hold up a little bit better and they, there won't be as much odor. And these, co and these colorants tend to hold up a little bit better in exterior environments as well. Industrial coatings, uh, again, for some of these fancy coatings that we're gonna talk a little bit about when we get into resins, what these coatings do, um, but they, these are generally very high in VOC. They have quite a bit of odor uh, and these are used in, in, in facilities and uh, different places that they need the impact of what the, that coating is gonna do. However, the solvent is, uh, is, is kind of narrowed to what you could use in these coatings. And we'll go over that a little bit more. So one of the other pigments that we go, we go through is extender pigments. Uh, these are, and again, when you start going into extender pigments, they add things like durability, gloss, and sheen, and, and scrubability. But they also, they, what they do is that they extend or help us to put in, remember where I mentioned TiO2 is part of one of the, is the most expensive components in paint. By adding these inert extender pigments, they are a little bit lower cost and they will give you a little bit better price product. The performance might not be there, but again, you're balancing uh, the price of the coating of what you're trying to get with, uh, with what you expect out of it. So these extender pigments are a big part of that. Um, again, it, the uh, extender and the primary, you'll get uh, talked about height and opacity. You'll find that the, uh, like we showed here, the titanium generally covers a little bit better. Calcium carbonate is one of the extender pigments and that doesn't generally cover or hide as much as the titanium does. Metallic, metallic pigments are essentially when you see a paint that has uh, aluminum flex in it or different type of um, metallic finishes to it, that's generally what we use here. Um, that's where that the kind of uh, the pigment is, is classified under. Zinc is used for anti-corrosive needs and paint and coatings itself. Um, and then a lot of, you'll see a lot of different uh, metallic coatings for walls. And again, that's just the kind of coating that we have there. And specialty coating, specialty pigments, they extend quite a bit. And this goes out into, you know, flame retardants and anti-fouling for boats. These are the, these are some of the pigments we have on there, but there's a wide variety of coatings on there. Um, again, generally, it's a good idea to, to, to get to know a, a local paint rep in the area that you work with so that they can explain to you the values and on um, why you should use certain coatings over another. And everyone who is selling a coat of paint should have a basic concept of what we're talking about here. So they can explain to you the need, the differences between one coating and another itself. Resins, this is a, these are known also as binders. This is kind of, to me, what the, the heart of the paint is itself. This allows to hold the pigment together so that it could be applied to the wall. It gives you adhesion um, and it gives you the, the film build, which is very, very key and when you're applying paint itself, and it'll give you the adhesion itself, most paints are named after the resin that's being used. For instance, if you see a latex paint, a latex paint is meaning that you're using a latex resin to use on there. So again, there's infinite different qualities and varieties. We'll touch a little bit on there, but that's what resins are. And, and they are really the, uh, the, the gives you the paint, the characteristics of what they're going to uh, the performance they're going to give you itself. Primarily, the ones that we're going to be working with or you're going to see most of the time is going to be a latex pigment and an alkin or an oil-based pigment. Talk a little bit more. Alkins are generally not being used as much because they tend to have a little bit higher VOCs. So there, you're going to see less and less of them as we move forward uh, in, your, in, the, in the paint business. So 
when you're looking with latex resins, there's all kinds of different types of resins. These are just a four of uh, four of the type that we that are part of the most prevalent. I'm sure all of you have heard of 100% acrylic resins and poly PVAs and uh, and styrene acrylics, uh, but they all have different performance characteristics and needs. 100% uh, acrylics generally have are good for inside outside. They have really good UV resistance, um, and it's essentially for outside. It's almost imperative that you use products that are 100% acrylic resins uh, in the in the in the uh, can of paint itself. So this is a real important part to have in South Florida because it gives us all the resistance that, like you see, for UV, alkali, um, efflorescence, and um, efflorescence is essentially um, the powder that sometimes you see on a wall, a little white residue, and it helps kind of resist against that itself. PVAs are generally a little bit more. Uh, economical. However, they have different need. They have different uses. For instance, you know, they are good for interior and exterior, but they give a little bit better scrub resistance, and they're a little bit better for washability. So sometimes in interior finishes, you don't need 100% acrylic as much as you do outside. So uh, again, balancing what you need uh, again with cost is always prevalent in every can of paint that's being sold in the market itself. Uh, styrene acrylics, and again, uh, these are. Uh, used to be used quite a bit over 100% acrylics, um, but they have uh, now have taken uh, kind of a second seat to 100% acrylics because uh, they're good for masonry, uh, they have good alkali resistance, and they have good efflorescence resistance. And most of the time when you see coatings and you see different price points, it's always a blend of the different type of resins and pigments uh, that you use along with the different qualities within. So that's why it's very confusing a lot of different things that are going on. For instance, in, in our line, we have over 4,000 SKUs. That's a lot to decipher, a lot to be able to narrow down, uh, but there is needs and uses for each one. That's why it's important to, to have a good relationship with a painting, uh, with a paint representative, because uh, that understands this and will deliver to you something that, that will be the, the fits your need for itself. So the other enhancements that we use in different type of uh, uh, the pigments or the resins that we use. There's uh, different things we add to resins itself, to those other resins we talked about to give it a product scuff resistance. There are a lot of urethanes now that are being uh, used in, 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 the, uh, in the latex or waterborne resins. Uh, these are kind of the up and coming uh, and epoxy, the, the up and coming type of uh, uh, resins that are being used. Um, the, the biggest change that you're seeing because of all the EPA laws is here, where you're seeing a lot of the typically solvent-based uh, uh, resins being are now being used in, in water-borne coatings. And uh, again, they're, they haven't quite reached it, but the technology is changing quite a bit. But they do give you a lot of chemical and abrasion resistance. And more importantly, they give you low odor and low VOCs, which is a real important part of what we're doing. Oil-based coatings, again, this is something that's not being used as much, uh, but you'll find a lot of oil-based coatings. These are the type of resins. Down to the lower right, uh, the waterborne alkyds, it's probably going to be where the most change is coming. Again, because of VOC, there's al actually technology being made used right now where you're using an oil-based resin, uh, and that oil-based resin could be used as solvent, could be used for as water for that. So it's different technologies coming along. So uh, th and this is the industries in the last 20 years have changed so much because of this, uh, and the change is going to be coming even at a further and faster rate of going forward. So the oleo resins, this is something we usually don't use at all in South Florida. Uh, they tend to yellow. The, the one thing with oil-based paints, regardless of anything that you use on here, oil-based paints will all amber or yellow. It's a uh, nature of the beast. It's based on where the resins are coming from. They're generally from natural-based systems or resources, and then nature allows these things to turn to, uh, to, to amber naturally. So these are some of the things that you need to look at. Um, alkyds, again, when it comes to oil-based paints in the past, especially, this has been uh, the most popular type of uh, alkyd uh, resin, uh, the resin to use in an oil-based family. It's hard. Uh, it gives you very durable has it's a very, uh, again, excellent penetration so that it gives you good adhesion, uh, but it does come with strong, with, a, with a, an odor and has very high VOC. So it's 
things that you have to think about. Waterborne outcomes, this is where we're trying, what manufacturers are trying to do is to repeat the performance of the alkyds and the other resins that we, that we talked about, but using a waterborne or water dispersive, or you know, using uh, chemicals that allow water to use as a solvent. So uh, these code, the, the technology and some of the changes happen. And this particular coating here has probably overtaken in our industry the alkyds that are being used today itself. So, and again, some of the and, and some of the enhancements um, typically in a in some of the other oil-based resins that have been used are epoxies and urethanes. Most of these are generally two components uh, where you have to mix up a part A and a part B, and one's the paint and one's the catalyst that activate that product. Uh, you're not going to run into a lot of this on your properties, but it's a, again an important part of what we're doing. A lot of these kind of coatings are used generally in the uh, industrial uh, environment more so than anything else because they do require quite a, they do give you a lot of chemical integration resistance. So one thing we need to talk about when you're working in South Florida, especially, is the difference between drying and curing. Uh, when you're using the resins that we're talking about and uh, and so forth, drying occurs, like it says on here, when uh, you know the, the solvent evaporates from the coating. That happens with latex paint probably in about 10 minutes. Oil-based coatings tend to take a little bit longer for it to dry. Sometimes and if you use a true alkyd coating, it could take you maybe a couple of hours for that product to dry um, to where it could it dry to the point where you could touch it. Curing though is when that particular coating reaches its optimum hardness. And there's a big difference with that. So the faster a coating dries, you know, and in South Florida, the, the biggest temperate, the biggest issue we have is the humidity. Uh, right now, when humidity is close to 150% outside, you're going to take coatings. So it's going to take a lot longer for it to draw to for that solvent to escape from the coating itself for it to um, uh, for it to cure. Uh, so the, and, and for it to dry itself while coating while the cure and that will affect the curing sometime itself because you need to have that solvent out of there. So. Um, Alkyd paint, oil-based paints that we talked about, will dry in about four to eight hours, depending on the kind of resin that you're using. And they're going to cure within 10 days pretty quickly because that's just the process of how uh, the alkyd resins work. Latex paints will dry in two to four hours, generally a lot less than two to four hours. But look how long it takes for it to cure. Um, so these are the, and this is the type of things that you'll, you, you have to take an account of when you're painting or specifying paints or trying to use paints, what is, you know, you have to balance everything to what it's going to give you what you need and to be able, you know, for instance, to, you know, uh, do we put a tape on the wall or could we put anything against the wall or on floor coatings as well? So these are the type of things you have to kind of keep in consideration when you're using it. Uh, the additives that we add to paint are things like mildew side, flow and leveling. Uh, that's an important part because you can't have a coating that it's going to look like a, like a piece of texture when you put on there. So flow and loving is a piece of real important part of the paint. And then the film formation is probably the most important part because paint is applied um, at a very thin amount. Generally, uh, one mil, uh, anywhere from two to four mils wet on a typical average latex coating that you're using, that's two to four one thousandths of an inch. And when it dries, it'll dry down to half of that or even less sometimes, to one mil or, or more. So out of that, you're supposed to get the protection, the durability, fade resistance, and the opaqueness or hiding. So it's a very, it's a very important part. That's why you have to really be careful uh, what you use and how you use it. Because uh, again, cheaper components will make a paint cover, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the paint is better just because it's covering. Because you've got a lot of other aspects you need to look at when you're looking at paint itself. We talked about this, but surfactants is an important part about paint. It's a, it, it basically is just a, it's, it's in, in layman's terms, it's a chemical, it's like a soap that allows all the components in a water-based paint uh, or in coatings to be able to, uh, to, to mix together evenly. And uh, exact, you know, like uh, we use a lot of this in water dispersible alkyds, that's the technology used, however, Sometimes surfactants, especially in our in our environment, can affect the performance of the coating, or at the time that you paint, will affect it as well. So these are things you have to keep in consideration. So uh, when you're using paint itself, these are the other type of drying add, uh, type of additives we use on here in paint itself. So 
there's a lot of different uh, there's a lot of different things that you use on here. Um, we'll get into a little bit of it, but again, it just there's so many different things on here. The one thing I like to look at is uh, rheology modifiers um, down at the bottom row. The rheology modifiers is probably where the most technology comes from in the paint industry in the last 10 or 15 years. Because again, rheology modifiers is essentially how much of a paint film is being left on the surface. And that allows us to be able to uh, balance a coating that's going to give you, uh, you know, a, a, a newer technology, but with, again, leaving the same amount of paint film that you need to protect that surface. And again, it always goes back to protecting the surface that you use on here. Solvents. And solvents is a, um, a again, the, if you were to take the pigment and the resin together, uh, you're going to have pretty much a paste and it's going to be very difficult uh, to apply onto the surface itself. So solvents promote the transfer of the coating uh, to, from uh, the bucket, in other words, to, you know, to the substrate you're trying to paint. Uh, it controls the viscosity or uh, the flow of the coating, how thick the coating is. And of course, most of these solvents will evaporate, in other words, into the atmosphere. And that, this is the part where uh, the, the EPA gets on the paint industry and where a lot of the changes are being driven itself. Uh, there's the types of solvents where oil-based paints are, are generally higher in volatile organic compounds than latex coatings itself. And oil-based compounds, uh, you know, for instance, in oil-based paints, mineral spirits, naphtha, xylol, all these fun things that have quite a bit of odor, uh, but these are very high in the VOCs. And when they evaporate, uh, they do affect the environment and the ozone layer. So uh, th this is being controlled quite a bit uh, by, you know, by the EPA and other organizations around the country. While latex paints are generally, water is generally the, uh, the lion's share of the solvent. So they, again, these are low in VOCs uh, and so forth like that. Now, what are volatile organic compounds? For those that don't know, um, essentially volatile organic compounds um, are, are found in oil-based paints and all these different things that we've talked about. And these are the carbon compounds that are all, and all these aids here that, that uh, evaporate into the atmosphere and, just, and hurt the uh, environment. So these are things that you have to be careful with. The solvent that, how do you determine a solvent to the coatings is determined by the resin. Um, a lot of the resins that are made uh, can only be mixed in certain type of solvents, but then at, at the same time, they give you certain characteristics so uh, that you need to pre in a particular certain a particular surface in regards to application, durability, and so forth. So this change in balance of the VOC content is really the, the biggest change that's driving in, in the paint business itself. So uh, we have to be very careful and you have to be careful um, when you're painting, especially interior hallways in a condominium or in an office building, uh, you have to be very, very aware of the VOC content and the emissions that these coatings uh, are, you know, the solvents evaporate into the atmosphere. Um, and it could change a, a, a lot. It could affect a lot of people and inadvertently without, you know, without you actually uh, understanding it if you don't pay attention to this part itself. So it's a real important part to, 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 to look at and understand. As I've been mentioning, the government changes quite a bit. Um, the, there's certain areas of the country, just to give you an idea, that control the amount of VOC that a can of paint has. And I'm going to give you an idea of what we have here. This is, you know, there's the Northeast, the ozone transport, the OTC as it's known. Um, there's different, uh, different communities um, have different higher, different levels where they, they, and what they're trying to do in these communities is to control the amount of VOCs that are released into the atmosphere and the coatings that were being used. Um, California is probably one of those that started it. The South Coast specific regulation I just put up, it's probably the most strictest regulation that we have uh, in the country itself. Um, a lot of the, uh, you can see that a lot of these, when you have this type of many uh, OT uh, kind of VOC regulatory uh, commissions, it makes it very difficult to, for a manufacturer to make that are selling national to make paints that couldn't fit every one of these pieces here. So um, that's where a lot of the um, a lot of the manufacturers are working with with the EPA to try to standardize that. And all the other areas in the country that are not working uh, in these specific areas, and you see Florida, we're not part of it. 
are part of what they call down here the AIM rule, which is the federal rule uh, for architectural and industrial maintenance codings. Uh, there are different certifications, different uh, private institutions and private organizations that do a lot of this kind of testing uh, and be able to give us the kind of information that, that uh, manufacturers need or that you need when you're working on here. So these are some of the organizations that you look for to get the certain type of certifications that you need when you're looking at different type of codings across the country. MPI on the right, not only do they do the VOC content but, and emissions testing that the others do, um, but they do a lot of performance characteristics about paint itself. So those things to look at. So in review, these are the four kind of, the four different uh, components of paint that you look at. So this is the things that you have to kind of keep in mind of. And VOCs is a real important part to kind of tie all this together. Um, when you look at paint, one of the biggest difference things that you have to look at is what sheen do I want? And what is a better sheen than another? So let me give you a kind of a, a real kind of basic understanding of sheens. Uh, gloss sheens are considered anything from satins usually to gloss. Uh, and then when you see a sheen, uh, the flats to the eggshells, the, the, the glosses are more durable and washable than, than the, uh, the lower sheen. However, they reflect more light so you can see more uh, imperfections on the surface. And, Put on a gloss paint on the surface and you'll see how good of a drywall job that you actually have. While the lower sheens, they hide more surface imperfections, makes it easier to touch up, but their, their touch up is a little bit easier. The satin, but again, one of the other things about the gloss, the, the gloss sheens, especially outside, tend to be a little bit more durable. Uh, they have a higher, a higher resin content. We'll see that in a minute. Gives you a little bit more durability. How we do this, we were talking before about the pigments and the resins. Well, the green paint film is the, the green bar, square bar you see there. That is essentially the resin that when you put a coat of paint on there, um, it gives it, it, you know, that's kind of what you, the, the resin does. It adheres, it gives it the film build. Remember I was saying about film build? When we make a, when manufacturers make a flat or similar gloss, we control the amount of pigment that goes in there. And we, a lot of times we use the, those extender pigments to do this with. And what we do, the more pigment we put into a coating, the more the light reflects off of this coating, uh, off the coating. So in other words, when you see the gloss and sheen, when you, when, when you look at a paint surface straight on, it's very difficult to tell what, she, what, you know, what sheen that level is. You have to look at it at an angle and then you see how shiny that is. And that's because as light reflects off of that, that um, the amount of the reflection will tell us whether a paint is real shiny or not. At night, you can't tell the, uh, what paint is shiny or not unless you touch it because again there's no light to reflect off the surface itself so going back to here the the flat surfaces tend to have a little bit more pigment to go on here uh the light re 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 refracts as we call it in the industry so that's why touch-ups are a little bit better with gloss finishes even a lot of times when you put a gloss paint you try to touch up with a gloss that difference of where you put the paint on there especially in an angle could see that a little bit more and there's all kind. I could talk all day about this, but um, a lot of times when you're painting interior surfaces, a long hallway with a flat finish, flat finishes are considered very elegant. The problem is, is try to clean that flat wall, especially on the smooth walls that are being used today. A lot of times you'll see these shiny areas, and that's not a defect in the paint. That's that those pieces of the pigments that are sticking out through the resin that are being almost sand it down a little bit when you wipe it with a rag and it causes the light to reflect. So that's why you get those things called shiners. So that's why it's kind of, a, again, back to a balance of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to do on an interior surfaces itself. So MPI, these are the kind of, there, there's no standard being used in the industry. MPI has a standard of what, um, of what sheen levels are. If you look back here, uh, we the paint industry measures sheen at an 85 degree angle, and we measure gloss at a 60 degree angle. If you look at the technical information on every can of paint, they should have that information available. Um, so that'll help determine the amount of gloss that you have on here. Um, however, even though MPI is asking you know, the industry to the paint manufacturers to come to one standard, a satin in my, man, in my company will not match necessarily a satin in Sherman Williams or anyone else. So these are the things you have to kind of keep into mind when you're looking at sheen levels itself and gloss levels when you're looking between coatings itself.
So uh, those are things to, uh, this is just talking about the, the, the information I just told you about here itself. So specifications. Um, specifications when you're painting anything, um, generally inside, mostly outside, a specification because, and, you, and you're getting a taste of this in the, in the presentation I'm making, there's a lot of different coatings. There's a lot of different qualities. There's a lot of different needs of each particular manu uh, of, uh, for each particular coating. And manufacturers try to match what a surface needs to the price point that you need and the durability you need at a, at a, at a, at a kind of reasonable uh, level. The specifications are a way that, uh, and most painting contractors, as you go, they understand paints, but sometimes they don't understand paints to the level that most paint uh, manufacturing uh, representatives and technical people will know. But the specification generally comes from the manufacturer. And what it does is that it gives us an opportunity to be able to uh, tell you kind of after interviewing and talking and understanding the surface that you're painting and the budget that you're looking at, to try to come up with a coding system that's going to deliver what you're looking for in regards to uh, all the aspects that you look when you look at a durability from aesthetics to coverage uh, and to the most importantly, durability and protection of your substrates. And that's a very wide, uh, wide conversation to have. And, uh, and again, you have to take in considerations, especially if you're painting inside, uh, you know, if you're gonna be painting an office, you gotta balance the odor level of the coating with the people that will be working in the office if they're there while painting, or that you might have to vacate an office. The same thing as, you know, if you're gonna paint a floor and a condominium, how long is it gonna take the floor to dry before anybody could walk on it? Because imagine some painted catwalks uh, in some of these units, uh, people have to stay inside their units for at least a couple hours, which in certain communities, that could be quite a burden. So these are things that you really have to kind of think about and taking considerations when you're doing that. Manufacturers reps, for the most part, will be able to tell you the best kind of coatings or at least give you guidance on what some things you have to look at and so forth. And the specifications will be able to tell the contractor, gives you, the, the manager or the, or the board member, how to, what to paint and how to paint it using the system that the manufacturer tells you. Um, painters know coatings real well, but at the same time, we know coatings to the sense that we, we wanna make sure that a coating that is applied is gonna give you the performance you need. While paint, sometimes painters don't quite, that's not their top priority. A lot of the times it's just, it is about expense and ease of application. While manufacturers will tell you what is the best paint your substrate needs for uh, all what for for the things that you're looking for and you're putting on a coat of paint. So uh, again, when we look do a specification, we look at the type of project, just all the things we talked about: environmental uh, conditions, expectations, where the property is located at. That's a real key uh, component. A lot of problems, a lot of surfaces. When you're painting along the ocean, gives you completely different types of surfaces that you need to protect. Different levels of protection and dry times as well. So these are things you have to do. Uh, then we also get into uh, certification so we can meet those certifications that you're looking at itself. So as we move forward with it, um, paint technology, there's uh, one of the things that's going on in the paint business, again, because of the uh, EPA changing the VOC levels, uh, paint te technology has really spurred a lot of manufacturers to have to change resins so what has happened now too is as, as the products are being, as the resins are being changed, manufacturers are now starting to take that opportunity to enhance these coatings to be able to give certain technology levels that maybe wasn't apparent or available before. So these are things that, uh, that we're doing as a coating itself. So for instance, um, scuff resistant paint has become a, uh, as part, is a very uh, important uh, type of technology that, uh, that has been uh, brought to the industry and, the la and recently in the last four to five years. Um, a sense of these are coatings that, um, you know, we address a challenge. For instance, uh, in, in high traffic areas where you get, in, in, you can see it in your homes or in the hallways or in schools where there's a lot of scuffs and marks on, a, on the wall itself. 
these areas, if you want to maintain the integrity or the look of these places, it takes a lot of uh, maintenance and a lot of repainting to be able to do that. Well, we've uh, a lot of manufacturers have developed this, this uh, scuff resistant paint that will resist this so that it, you won't be able, you know, so you don't have to as many scuff marks. It'll stay better longer. You won't have to touch up as, as much. And then at the same time, it'll minimize the cost and, and maximize the service that you're doing. So these kind of systems themselves are, are, are real important and, and what's going on here. So um, the uh, so that's just part of the changes that we're doing. But look for your manufacturer to be able to understand that as well. Um, what's in the future for paint itself? Uh, there's a lot of different changes that's going on in paint. Um, there, there are things called thermochromic, photochromic, electrochromic. These are different things where um, you're going to be able to see the uh, the, the type of coatings that's, that's, that's coming. Thermochromic is temperature related. So if you have a coating that will change colors when, uh, when, it, uh, when it gets heat on it. Uh, photochromic is when you get light on the surface itself. For instance, similar to the glasses that we wear that change colors, these, are, will, change, these will tend to change um, colors and there's coatings that are gonna be affected by that. Electrochromic is really kind of, um, uh, part of a real exciting part of the industry where by electrical charges, you're gonna be able to see that. And, and you're all thinking, oh, this doesn't happen. Recently, uh, probably about, oh, about four or five months ago, BMW came out with their first color changing car. You can look it up on Google and look at it where the, the, you could change the color of a car on the code that it's using itself. And again, paint is paint, the same basic components. And this, uh, and by changing these colors, cars, it's a pretty fascinating look to it. Uh, but then again, especially with the pandemic that we went through, biotechnology making coatings that are going to be resistant to COVID and other uh, issues that we're dealing with, and then a lot of other different type of things like something called carbon uh, carbon nanotube technology, where it gives us uh, to be able to get different type of finishes that we're trying to get, especially in flat finishes, but with the durability and performance that you're going to need on here, as well environment uh, for marine coatings, marines uh, a marine surface, especially when you're working with metal very, very uh, uh, high, it's a, it's a surface that is very, you know, that's uh, highly environmentally damaging to surface that you're painting on. So a lot of these coatings that are being made are to let some of these, uh, to let a lot of these surfaces are being painted to last a little bit more and last a little bit longer on these things. So there's a lot, of, there's a lot going on with paint. Uh, paint is a, like any other industry, it's a very mature industry. It's been around for a long time. There's a lot of competitors. There's a lot of misunderstanding and there's a lot of misleading, but again, there's a lot of things that you could use uh, that will enhance and give you the surface, the, the performance that you need. Don't price coatings, don't price paint uh, based on just price itself. Always look at, the, at what you're trying to accomplish and uh, paying a little bit more for a can of paint will give you the more durability that you're gonna need on your substrates uh, and performance itself. On any typical paint job, no matter the size, the cost of the coating is generally going to be is going to be generally from 15 to 20 percent or 25 percent of any job inside or out to the labor amount that's needed on the job itself. So, a lot of times everybody wants to cut down on the quality of coatings to change. However, the the labor is the biggest piece. So that's the part that uh, you know why spend a few dollars less when the performance is going to be a little bit inferior, but the, the application and the labor needed to put the coatings on is going to be the same. So you, you're saving a little bit, you're really not saving in the long run on the job itself. So these are things that you need to take to, uh, to take in consideration itself. So other than that, so we talked about the, uh, we talked about the four components. We looked at that a little bit. Uh, we talked about a little bit about the different type of paint finishes and how that's going to work. And my role or my role of a manufacturing rep when you're reviewing a specification and the uh, reviewing the, uh, the, again, that we went over the paint technology and some of the stuff we went on. So that in a nutshell is pretty much what we have. So again, um, uh, I will be more than happy to answer any kind of questions that you have. Uh, if I can't get to them now, I'll be more than happy to uh, pass the uh, questions, uh, answer the questions later on for you. Uh, there, again, like uh, Ashley was saying, the presentation will be available to you. And of course, 
if you have any inf any type of systems or any type of questions in regarding coatings, feel free to give me a call. I would uh, sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rudy. We really appreciate it. I did just go ahead and launch that survey. It's a poll. If you can please take that, it's just three questions. And I do want to just reiterate, I am going to be sending the list of attendees to Rudy to um, handle the credits. Um, how long do you think you should give for that, Rudy? A week or two, maybe? Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, I just talked to the girl. She's not in the office this week, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and uh, But what I'm looking at probably about a week, week and a half. I know the sensitivity of getting these credits turned around quickly. So I'm going to be sending them in. As soon as I get the list from you, Ashley, I'm going to put them in. And again, if you have any inquiries and in, into regard to that, feel free to reach out to me at any time with an email. Uh, we'll do it. Um, if you want a certificate, please email me so I could put one together. Generally, uh, I'm not doing certificates any longer. But again, if you do need one or would like one by any, for any reason, again, feel free to, to let me know and I'll send one to you electronically. Perfect, perfect. And I am going to be sending out the presentation. Um, the video recording to this webinar, I will be sending an email. It'll include Rudy's contact information and then all of our future events. So you will have all of that in an email in case you do need to reach out to Rudy or to me. Um, so I think that's it. I mean, there's a few questions, yep. I think, here in the chat. I will okay. leave it open if you want to answer a few questions, Rudy. Um, sure. Otherwise, thank you so much. You did a great job, as always. Okay. Do you want me to, uh, can I answer a couple of them yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go okay. ahead. I'll leave it open. Right. I've got one here. It says, do um, exterior paints uh, have anti-mold and mildew additives? The answer is yes, they should. Um, again, they are anti-mold and mildew. Remember to keep this in mind. They help resist mildew, but they're not going to stop mildew from growing on the surface outside. So the best way to do that is by cleaning the exterior surface on a regular basis uh, and going forth from there. Okay. And, and let's see here. And all right, and uh, the, the tell us how a coating is a latex or acrylic. Again, as part of the presentation, we talked about latex is the type of resin you're doing. An acrylic, re the acrylic latex is basically just a latex resin, but has a, 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 it has acrylic, uh, an acrylic type of resin to it. So they, again, a lot of different qualities. Most, the better quality paints will be close to 100% acrylic. Well, other resins will have different levels of paint on there itself. Um, what surface do you, what do you use to clean a mold surface? This is a question I'm asked a lot. Um, what you want to try to do on here is the, the best way to kill, you, you need to kill the mold or the mildew that you have on there. The, the, most, ex, the most effective and cost resistant method to do that is to, of course, to use bleach uh, or to, a, a kind of variety of bleach itself. But again, there's a lot of issues that you have with that. It's a chemical. It will kill plants. There are a lot of other type of new chemicals that are being used that are a little bit more environmentally friendly that will help kill the, mil the mold and the mildew. And uh, these are things that you could use on there. Uh, but again, the mold and the mildew is, again, never paint on top of it. If you see anybody pressure cleaning and when you have mold, on, especially on the outside of a building, and pressure cleaning, not using any kind of chemical, and then paint over top of it, all they're doing is removing the excess mold and mildew. They're not killing it, and you're going to have those mildew spores. You know, mildew is the the state flower of Florida, and what you're going to have is that those spores are going to be caught underneath the paint. Painting over top of it does not kill it, and it's going to start to grow. And because paints breathe, and, and that and that passes moisture, and that mildew spore will begin to grow and expand, especially in the hot weather that we're dealing with, and you're going to have quite a problem. To get rid of it because the only way to do that then is to um to remove the coating and you know what that entails so again clean it's sanit and sanitizing a surface when you're removing mold is what you're trying to do not just remove it so you need to sanitize that surface itself okay and i think that's what we have on here uh so hey if anybody has any questions again i look forward to it again ashley thank you for the time and I appreciate the opportunity to do, to, uh, do this presentation to, to everyone out there. And again, thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rudy. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Thanks for watching. For more great educational content, click the subscribe button now.